keep my comments very brief. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I think you did point out at the beginning of the testimony um, some of the problems with the limits on this in, in terms of looking into specific violations, felonies, one type of misdemeanor. Um, that is a great concern to law enforcement. Um, secondly, just, just again on a broad level, um, there was some testimony about um, the subject of these searches. And there was a reference that these are people who are being targeted by law enforcement. And I would just point out that really, these are people who are being investigated by law enforcement for crimes that they commit, <coughs> they commit. perhaps people that were going to exonerate if we can, we can investigate thoroughly. So um, I understand why that term is used, but really from the law enforcement perspective, we're trying to protect the society in general. Um, and we do have some concerns with this bill and some of the limitations that it plays. And thirdly, I can just guarantee the committee that um, uh, we certainly don't track people for political activity, and we certainly don't connect misdemeanor offenses to political activity. So that's, that is not what we conducted by law enforcement. Um, I would like to refer to Mr. Evans for some further information, Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Drew Evans. I'm the Assistant Superintendent at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. I just wanted to point out some concerns that we have concerning this bill as currently written for the committee to consider. This technology, uh, the committee should be aware, has been vitally important to Minnesota law enforcement in apprehending violent criminals throughout the state of Minnesota. This week alone, our agency at the BCA has apprehended an individual for first degree assault, the highest level of assault in, in our current statutes, second degree assault, which is assault with a dangerous weapon, and a murder suspect, and that's just this week alone. It's regularly used for these types of crimes throughout the state, and we want to make sure that this is used to mitigate ongoing criminal activity and <coughs> additional criminal activity throughout the state. As Senator Peterson has noted, he supports those goals. We support many of the goals of this um, bill as written, and primarily that that we agree that probable cause um, is judicial oversight is the appropriate standard. However, we have some pragmatic concerns about the bill as written. The one that we've addressed and I think we've discussed in detail is the felony limitations on the bill. Um, oftentimes when we're investigating crimes, we don't know the exact level of the crime or what it may be. We're looking at particular conduct and trying to mitigate that ongoing criminal activity um, and to prevent further violence from happening in many instances. Some of the other concerns, and the, one of the things that I do want to be uh, careful to point out, Minnesota law enforcement, this is not an NSA-like program that's being operated in Minnesota. I understand the concerns and the valid concerns about such programs being operated in the state. Minnesota law enforcement is not conducting surveillance of individuals or uh, 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 general surveillance and intelligence gathering activities unless some person is a target of a criminal investigation, and that is how we're doing this currently. We're currently getting a court order um, under the 626A statutes as written. And while the statutes are dated and haven't kept up, we have always considered the electronic tracking device language that's already in that statute to apply to this situation. So we've been getting court orders right now that are reviewed and approved by a judge that the standard is not a probable cause standard, it's relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation, meaning that there's some logical connection between criminal activity and the order that's being granted um, to track this information. The, uh, we have, do have concerns about the historical um, information that we gather. This, this bill would apply um, for historical records. Currently, we get those records through a search warrant. And so that is the mechanism in which we get historical uh, information. It's been referred to by one of the previous testimonies that we're using administrative subpoenas. We are not using administrative subpoenas to gather location information. The companies do not provide that information with an administrative subpoena. There is certain information that you can get related to that, but we do not get location information right now from administrative subpoenas. The, uh, one of the most important informational uh, pieces that we're always looking at, and I want to be clear to the committee, that the statutes, we're always evaluating these new technologies in terms of the Fourth Amendment that was alluded earlier. We have interest in only gathering evidence in a criminal investigation that will be used in the court of law and that will be admissible in the court of law. So every time we get a new piece of a technology, we are constantly doing evaluation as to how to implement that technology in the confines of our current statutes and our current criminal procedure in the case law at the time. 
So we continually evaluate that cell phone information and location data is one of those that we've looked at um, in the recent um, history. So we definitely um, agree with the, um, the probable cause standard. However, the term search warrant as used in the bill, we have concerns with. We think that the chapter 626A that covers pen registers, uh, mobile tracking devices, and um, other information related to phones and gathering information on an ongoing perspective basis is a better statutory construct, which is where this is being placed. And search warrants are not contemplated in that chapter right now. We're concerned that there will be some, um, some conflict between the search warrant statute, which is in 626, and then 626A when we're um, examining all these particular statutes in particular. And some of the concerns specifically we have about it is with search warrant considerations, there's certain filing uh, deadlines that are under the search warrant statute. There's a different sealing process that is uh, in order to delay notice or filing of that search warrant is uh, uh, governed by Minnesota Rule of Criminal Procedure 33.04. And with these notice requirements that are outlined in this bill, again, we would have a, a, a concern as to which one applies. Does the sealing method that is outlined in the Rules of Criminal Procedure apply? Does this particular statute apply? And are the time frames different between the two? So as we know it, and I, I, I'm happy to answer any other questions or anything additional, our concern about the search warrant language is really from a pragmatic standpoint. The search warrant is truly designed to be a search of a particular location, a person, a thing, at a set point in time. Whereas this particular information is being used as a prospective, ongoing um, monitoring of location data when we're trying to look for a targeted and criminal investigation. And so that, that 626A statute is better designed for that process, which is what we've been doing um, to date. And we have been having judicial review of that. We support, as noted, a different branch of government, the judicial branch, reviewing our court orders and approving anything that we're doing in terms of this technology. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Senator Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to um, respond, and I, I do um, actually agree with the, um, I don't seek to sort of confuse the issue between the NSA uh, surveillance programs and PRISM and all of those things. I really don't think that's what the debate is about. I know it was met, mentioned, and I certainly am not accusing uh, Minnesota law enforcement of also mm -hmm. sort of surveillance of the population at large. Um, I will point out, though, that um, the testimony as it was started out um, outlined three crimes. Uh, uh, I think it was, it was in the last week, uh, an assault, first degree assault, a second degree assault with a deadly weapon, and a homicide were referenced. And that certainly those are really uh, uh, tear at uh, you know, the emotion it, uh, that's attached to the testimony there. Um, but it's worth pointing out that every one of those instances would have qualified under the language of this bill. Um, uh, every one of those um, crimes would have been something that would have fell within the confines of the language that we have here. Um, uh, and then um, lastly, I think, um, you know, it's not unprecedented. Um, in fact, the BCA law enforcement in the state of Minnesota already right now um, is, is getting search warrants when they place when they're placing physical tracking devices on vehicles. Um, the Jones decision in 2012, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that that um, was um, uh, was something that required a probable cause search warrant. And um, I would argue to the members of the committee that uh, if that is deemed as an invasive search, that certainly a device which has the capability to not just be attached to your vehicle, but is on your person, uh, for many of us, <laughs> for too many hours of the day, 24 hours a day, as you walk down the street, as you get into another vehicle, or maybe you take the bus, or maybe you take a transit line, um, that in fact, uh, the capabilities of the prospect of you being tracked via your cell phone is actually much more invasive than simply placing a physical device that is able to track your vehicle alone. So if we have the search warrant standard there, I would, I would argue that it would be an obvious extension uh, to extend probable cause standard to uh, a, an invasive search or an invasive track, such as a, a, a cell phone. Uh, that's it, Mr. Chair, for now. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Um, Mr. Evans, thank you for your testimony. 
uh, or did you go to the court and get a uh, court order? And if not, why did you decide, or, or why did the law enforcement community decide to use that process as opposed to uh, the search warrant process? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, we, the statute already outlines um, in 626A, which governs electronic and, and phone uh, records and the prospective gathering, it indicates in there that we do uh, need to obtain a court order in order to obtain those records. And same thing with electronic tracking device, we've always interpreted that the phone, when we're tracking that, falls under those provisions. So the standard is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation, and that's what we've noted. We would support a probable cause standard within that statute. The uh, opposition of using a search warrant is, again, from a pragmatic concern. There are a number of provisions within the search warrant statute that make it very difficult to implement. We do use it for mobile tracking devices now as a result of the Jones decision, but the decision had to do very specific basis that it was based on a trespass that found it to be a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. In other words, the physical intrusion. So we thought that was the best mechanism at the time to utilize that. However, um, the 626A chapter is a better mechanism for us to utilize in this particular type of activity. Uh, yeah, Chairman. Uh, so to the testifier, uh, so isn't one of the biggest differences between uh, the search warrant and court order, outside the fact that I know with a search warrant, you have to uh, uh, do an affidavit and swear to the court and articulate the reasons why the court should grant the court order, but there's also a requirement for a notice because once you execute a search warrant, isn't it true that you have to leave notice? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, that's true, and we don't um, oppose providing notice um, in, in this uh, in this bill, the, the requirements that we look at, and with a search warrant, for example, you need to provide a receipt and inventory and return, and that can be sealed. The search warrant and the affidavit included can be sealed by the court, and that's what's governed by the rules of criminal procedure under 33.04. And that outlines that process for sealing a search warrant um, for a variety of reasons outlined in the, that rule. And my last question, Mr. Chairman, if you wanted to to ascertain, let's say, mail with a person's name on it at a particular address to link them and connect them to a location. In order to get that mail, is it true that you have to execute or, or ask the court for a search warrant in order to go into that person's home in order to, to, to get pieces of mail or anything that will connect them to, to that home? And if you do have to do that, then what is the legal basis that the court or we should look at in order to determine whether you should have to get the same sort of, or do the same process in order to get someone's um, electronic records? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, I, I think I understand the question. It, it, we definitely, to go into your home, would need a search warrant. Um, to anybody's home, would need to go into a search warrant to look for any papers, um, regardless if it's mail or other items from there. Uh, again, and, and some of this becomes a little bit semantics. The search warrant is a court order. It's an order by the court approving our search of a residence, place, or thing. The court order and what makes it that search warrant and what the standard of review is, is that probable cause. So obtaining, and that's why we say we support obtaining this location information based on a standard of probable cause standard of review by a detached neutral judge that is reviewing our order. So we would support a probable cause standard to, to obtain um, records, uh, specific records to location. So, Mr. Evans, you support the house language on uh, this? Yes, we support the house language uh, uh, related to this issue. Senator Sharon. Thank you. Um, Chief Inco, you mentioned in your comments that you were concerned about the time frames that are in this legislation. Would you? Uh, describe what your problems are with them and what, how you would improve the language, what you would recommend to the author of the bill to make it more palatable to you? Mr. Chair, Senator. Chief Paul. I think that really just reflects the mechanics that Mr. Evans talked about. 60-day time frame, you may add another 60-day time frame on it, and somewhere in there is a 10-day period for notification. It's just, it's just the mechanics and the operatives that try to line up those time frames. And, and as Mr. Evans testified, 
stay within the court order process, which we think works for us already. So I've done it, but it's just more efficient. Yeah. And Mr. Chair, sorry, Mr. Gold, one other thing. Um, there was a comment about the crimes that Mr. Evans uh, cited that will be violent crimes. And, and I think that's true, <coughs> excuse me, and I think for the, for the BCA, that's most often the case. The local law enforcement, we much more frequently do it with the lower level offenses, the thefts, and the cameras, and oftentimes exonerating them. So I don't think it's surprising that the violations of the PCA sites are the violent offenses. But for local law enforcement, it's, it's very often the lower level offenses. Still a crime to place. Well, Mr. Franklin has signed up to testify as well. Did you wish to speak, Mr. Franklin? In the interest of time, I think you have heard what I would probably say. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room that wishes to testify on this bill? I'm not seeing anyone come forward. Um, May I ask one more question? Yeah, of course. Senator Sherman. Um, I'm sorry, Chief. I, I, I heard your answer, but I didn't completely understand it. That you were saying that the language in the bill, in terms of time frames, is difficult to sequence, I guess, and to manage, and that you prefer that it stay within the probable cause? Is that what you said, the probable cause language? And, and you have to understand, I'm not in law enforcement and I'm not a lawyer, so you need to articulate clearly why, if you think that's preferable, it is preferable, and how it provides the same assurances that the author has about um, timeliness and, and, and sort of restricting the free access to this information. Mr. Chair. Chief Paul. Um, and Senator Sharon, um, I am in law enforcement, but I am also not a lawyer. I, I think I, to do this justice, I would refer again to Mr. Evans to talk about Mr. Evans? Uh, I mean, it, so, Mr. Chair, Senator Sharon, the uh, probable cause standard of review, when you're talking about that, it's reasonable grounds to suspect that a person is committed or is about to commit a crime, um, that that place was then contains specific items related to that crime. In other words, we'd have to show to the court that we have probable cause that the information we are seeking to gather and locate that person is reasonably related to that crime. That, that, that there's a connection between the two, and that's the probable cause standard of review, which is higher than the relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation standard we're currently utilizing on the basis of But, but make, make, I want to make sure you understand, I understand that, that part I got. But what I thought I heard our sheriff say is, and what I think the author's talking about in establishing some of these time frames, perhaps I don't understand, is that it's just not an ongoing that it doesn't go on forever that you have the right to gather this data. The time frames are related to the concern the author has about that. Uh, endless kind of examination and freedom to get into the privacy of an individual. And I don't know how probable cause speaks to that issue. I thought I heard the sheriff say it did, and I don't get how it does. And I don't know how to resolve the issue that the author is trying to address with his language about these time frames through probable cause. Mr. Evans. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Sharon, I, I, we support the 60-day time frames that are in the bill and the length of the order and then the optional ability to go back to the, the judge and request an additional extension. So we find that to be a reasonable period of time for the monitor. I think what you're hearing when we're referring to the time frames are the notice requirements and what they may place upon law enforcement in regards to that. For example, uh, the three-day notice requirement, um, once we obtain location information, if one of these adverse results um, do not occur and that we cannot seal that information, we may still be gathering information related to a crime, but we'd have to notify the individual that we are uh, locating using location information if these adverse results are not identified and the judge does not sign the order delaying the notice. And so it would, in that situation, if we have the ongoing criminal investigation notify of the activity and, and the results of that investigation. That's what we're talking about when it comes to that. And 
currently under, like I noted before, under the rules of criminal procedure, there is a process in place that provides for sealing of search warrants in the way of that type of activity in the North Division in that particular uh, rule of criminal procedure already. Remember, uh, I think for discussion purposes anyway, I want to have the A5 amendment passed out just for the committee to consider because we've been talking about it, but we haven't actually put language in front of us. It's the house language that as it currently exists. Um, I'm not sure what direction the committee wants to go on this, uh, but I thought I'd just make language. Um, Mr. Chair, the first one, it's still going to, it talks about the state court administrator and who's going to be on the state court administrator. Is there a fiscal note to the finance? Is there a Yeah, Senator Dietzik, um, I've actually had some conversations with fiscal staff about this, and, and with the state court administrative uh, duties that are uh, identified in the bill, um, I think it's pretty clear cost uh, to them, and it's probably, they'll probably need to go to finance uh, because of that. Yeah, okay, thank you, Senator. Senator Jason, I'm on 4.26. The state court administrator is authorized to issue binding regulations dealing with the content in form. So they're just going to issue, like, here's how we want the data, the top above the reporting data coming to us. Is that just basically what they, why do you call it binding regulations? I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, um, which line are you on? 4.26. 4.26? Yeah. Is it considered, maybe just a normal terminology? Can't you just say in a formal content, you know, what was laid out or what was laid out by binding regulations? Um, it's just, uh, I believe the language, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, the, la the language as I understand it, uh, simply gives the state court administrator the ability to um, uh, to disseminate the information in the medium that they feel is appropriate and complies with the, um, the mandate in paragraph A. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, it's, and I was reading this, um, the reporting data, is this the identified data or does it, does it identify? You know, who the, the date of the warrant, does it identify who the subject is in there? Uh, no, Senator. Uh, okay. If you go through uh, the first seven clauses of subdivision five, uh, the first seven clauses of subdivision five outline the data or the information that needs to be reported. So individualized data is not one of those things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. So, members, uh, council handed out the A4 amendment, not the A5, because the A4 is actually drafted to the A3 amendment that was already adopted at Senator Peterson's request. So, uh, I just wanted to, I guess, highlight a couple of the provisions for your attention. And uh, um, on page two, um, you'll see uh, subdivision two, it says a court order is required, doesn't specify um, a warrant or a search warrant. Um, and then uh, line 13 specifically refers, makes that reference. Um, that's different than line 15 of the uh, of Senator Peterson bill. And then uh, you'll also see um, on one of the a four minute line 15 specifies uh, the commission of a crime, the last two words on that line, as opposed to line 18 and 19 of uh, Senator Peterson's bill, which uh, refers to the commission of felony level offense as well by domestic violence related offense. Uh, so those are like, the two key differences. Um, there are a couple other other smaller uh, differences, if I characterize it that way. Some language is a little bit different, but you know, I could tell on my scanning of it if uh, the rest of the bill is essentially uh, the same. Um, 
So I, I'm not sure what you know, the committee's preference would be on this. Um, it does specify a probable cause standard. Um, it looks like it's, it's in 626A, not 626, as it sounds like the BCA would prefer that it be drafted to. So, and, and this is, anyway, this is the, the language that, it, that uh, Representative Atkins and his chairman of the House is uh, progressing over it. Just FYI. Mm -hmm. you know, Mr. Chair, Senator Lund. Even though we uh, try not to refer to the body in such a specific manner, because we violated that rule, but uh, <coughs> that's I have a question about page 2, line 15, about the committed crime. I believe that this is most likely an expansion of the use of this technology. Uh, I know that I talked with my local sheriff in Hampton County, and he assured me that he only used it for uh, exceptionally uh, or for uh, felon cases. And if anything under that, it really would not justify using a, a stingray or a kingfish type method to use that system. This seems to be expanding the authority now in law to apply to any I, I don't think you've met misdemeanors. I hope you didn't. Uh, or gross misdemeanors, but perhaps you did. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about that. I think this type of legislation is a reaction that by what I've seen over the years is that law enforcement seems to get new gadgets all the time. And we as policymakers are left in the dark. We don't know what they have. And, uh, Kingfish, the Stingray program that took us quite a few years to determine that. The license plate readers took seven years of operation in Minneapolis until a reporter put it into a newspaper that the Minneapolis Police Department was using license plate readers. And government officials, policy makers, we were left in the dark. There might be a, a, a need for upcoming legislation to require law enforcement to tell policy makers what kind of gadgets they have. Uh, there's the talk of drones uh, that could be used and then maybe not used. Those are things that we don't even know about. And I'm sure there's other things that I don't know, but, but now we have a reaction once we find out what's been used and we're trying to determine uh, what is the appropriate use. And the best guide that we have is the Constitution. And so, as I've been examining this issue, um, I think Senator Peterson is going down the right road. I certainly don't want to create an opportunity where we use high-tech, expensive or technology, and then we're going to apply it to misdemeanors or uh, low-level crimes. Uh, this is the use of an intrusive device to follow the whereabouts of individuals. And, uh, as the, even though I'm comforted by the use of a probable cost standard, uh, I still believe and still find greater comfort in the use of a search warrant. Um, I'm concerned that law enforcement has available to itself uh, whatever <coughs> means or gadgets or toys that they have that we don't know about. We don't have an inventory of that. I'm concerned that the people of Minnesota don't have adequate notice from our professionals in order for us to make adequate policies. And now we're catching up again. Uh, we had this discussion back in the meanwhile with the chairman of this committee. And, uh, and we started to experiment down this path. We thought that it was going to be taken care of administratively. And yet, the issue keeps surfacing. So I think it does require us to have involvement and uh, put some uh, curves to uh, how we go about establishing this type of technology as it relates to criminal investigations. I, I'm in favor of the A3 amendment, Mr. Chair, and, and not the A4. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to try and do this much quicker than Senator Thanks. 
Uh, and, and in part, you know, all in favor, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in part, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that we're coming up against the midnight deadline. Uh, I prefer uh, the author's uh, approach uh, to giving a, a search warrant. I think that's preferable. However, I prefer the language in the A4 that deals with all, all terms rather than the limitation in the author. Yeah. So just to confuse the issue a little bit, <laughs> and like add to reach. Uh, and, and I don't, and I'm not saying that facetiously. I prefer the search warrant. I think it should be for all of all Mr. Chair, and, um, as I've said, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. As I've stated a couple of times, I have no problem with the latter suggestion by Senator Newman, um, if that's the will of the committee, although I would strongly suggest uh, that we uh, stick with the search warrant requirement and not go about inventing a new mechanism or new standard. Um, um, moving forward, um, I think, uh, well, I don't need to reiterate the points that are made. I would prefer to stick with the A3 amendment, um, but certainly can um, consider uh, the, uh, all, all crimes if that's what the committee wants to do. I think I will point out that uh, the language um, relating to the about to commit, you know, the about to commit language was also in the A3. Um, it just was the felony threshold versus any crime. Um, so, uh, just to speak to that. Senator Miller, uh, Mr. Chairman, given um, Senator Peterson's uh, comments, uh, I would move that the A3 be amended to include the all crimes language uh, in whatever method Mr. Bankus can, can do it for us. Mr. Chair, members, so the A3, uh, page 2, line 18, delete everything after A. So delete felony level, always A, and delete everything before the period on line 19, insert crime. So the about to commit A crime. Senator Newman moves that amendment. Is there any further any discussions on the amendment? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Amendments adopted. Is there any further discussion or amendments relating to this bill? Anyone else in the room wish to testify? Mr. Chairman. Senator Newman. I would move the A3 amendment as a member of the as a member of speak to this since I'm not a member of the committee or not, but um, what is the rationale for the referral to finance? There's no fiscal cost according to uh, fiscal staff. Uh, actually, uh, fiscal staff has advised us that um, with the uh, duties that are mandated for the courts in terms of keeping track of and reporting <coughs> and uh, um, all of the uh, information, aggregating it, Reporting the aggregated information to the legislature on an annual basis, um, that there would be some specific activities, of course, that have to engage in that we have across. That was for the Senate staff. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. The school staff. The reporting requirement in the Senate bill is, is annual and extensive in the House bill and biennial. And um, um, I believe. It deserves a, uh, a look from the state court administrator. And uh, if she determines that the court can absorb those costs, um, the bill can adopt it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have a motion. It's 
our understanding that the House, uh, Mr. Chair, members, it's our understanding that the House had deemed that the language uh, did not have a fiscal moment. Of course, the Senate has its own prerogative. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy moving on to uh, my merry way to find this. Senator Peterson, if uh, the State Court Administrator determines that there is no cost, uh, we still need to have finance and so on and so forth. It will end up in this division anyway uh, in finance. <coughs> so Senator Newman uh, renews his motion that Senate file uh, 2466 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Senate Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion to the bill. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, thank you for uh, your very, uh, for your perseverance tonight and also your very uh, thoughtful discussion and deliberations on difficult issues. Uh, so, uh, members, uh, we are going to adjourn. We'll uh, have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, we're We've got a four session scheduled at 11 and a couple of items to do. I'm not sure if all paper pushing or if the bills or not. Um, but uh, our plan is to reconvene tomorrow at 11.30 or immediately following the end of the session. And uh, we have about 15 bills on the agenda. Uh, so, Judiciously as we can, the Senator Newman can get to his. Uh,